Greetings, everyone. My name is Jason. I'm with Cell Science Systems. We're excited to share tonight's event about recent research from Yale School of Medicine on the ALCAT test. I'm joined by our CEO, Roger Davis Deutsch, who will be introducing our speaker. After the main presentation, we will have a Q&A period. Please submit any questions through our live chat, which you can find to the right of this window. Roger, would you like to introduce Dr. Mihal? Uh, certainly. Thank you, Jason. Our guest um, speaker tonight is Dr. Wajahat Mahal. He is a gastroenterologist and lead professor of medicine, digestive diseases at the Yale School of Medicine and director of the Yale Weight Loss Program. He obtained his MD and his PhD in immunology from Oxford University Medical School, having completed his certification for AB of Internal Medicine for Gastroenterology in 2001. Dr. Mahal is involved in many departments and organizations, including internal medicine, digestive diseases, hepatology, viral hepatitis program, metabolic health and weight loss program, the liver center, and others. He has performed extensive research into sterile inflammation, liver fibrosis, and liver immunology. Dr. Mahal's research is cited in numerous publications. Hi, um, good afternoon, um, everybody. So um, thank you for that introduction. I would like to you know, go through these two studies, and I'd like to start off with uh, the clinical study, which um, um, uh, you know, we're all very excited about. Um, please let me know if the sound, et cetera, is coming across OK. Is that fine? Every is that fine? Um, OK, great. And then also, I'm not sure if your viewers have the ability to ask questions as we go through this. But if they do, then they sh please feel free to just ask questions as well. Um, so this is a clinical study. Um, and this actually is the first um, you know, randomized controlled trial of this nature, um, looking at uh, the effects um, of using um, guidance from the ALCAT test to design the diet um, for patients with IBS. What I'd like to do is initially in about two minutes, um, just go over uh, and summarize um, the, the main significant findings from this study. And then I'd like to take you through this in a little bit more detail. So as, as many of you will know, irritable bowel syndrome is a very prevalent um, condition. And um, many, you know, approximately 60% of patients with irritable bowel syndrome actually report symptoms of food related to or symptoms of IBS related to certain foods with some improvement um, when they avoid particular foods. Um, and because of this, you know, a number of elimination diets have been developed. Um, and the best known of these is called the low FODMAP diets that's removal of fermentable oligosaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And, um, and this clearly shows some benefit, but it's a very restrictive diet to follow. And um, what we wish to do is because there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that the leukocyte activation test is effective in a number of conditions, including IBS, we wanted to carry out a rigorously controlled randomized clinical trial. Um, I'll go through the methodology in a minute, but the main findings were that there were statistically significant benefits seen in global improvement and symptom severity scale over a four week period when a diet was um, designed using the results of the leukocyte activation test. And this really provides novel data suggesting that this test can be used to develop an individualized diet for patients with IBS. Um, in addition to this, we wanted to dig a little bit more deeply scientifically, and, and we had performed a proteomic screen. And that uh, proteomic screen from the plasma suggested that, that um, there was a reduction in plasma elastase, which is a neutrophil protein in patients who responded well. Um, and the immediate clinical impact of this really is that um, it strongly suggests that the leukocyte activation test can be used to develop um, an individualized diet program, which would help patients with um, IBS. So more specifically, if we go through with this, um, what we have is um, a study design, which is a parallel group randomized clinical trial with two arms allocated in one-to-one -one ratio. So what that essentially means is that um, of our, all the subjects who met the inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, ALCAT test was sent off and their um, foods which had strong reactivity or you know, very positive reactivity and also negative reactivity were identified. Um, the, the 
participants were obviously diagnosed initially to have IBS based on the uh, current, at that time, criteria, which were the Rome 3 criteria. Um, and then if they were on concurrent IBS medications, that was fine, as long as there were no changes in dosages in the 30 days prior to enrollment. And then, if, but if patients had any other severe significant GI disease, such as inflammatory bowel disease, for example, they were excluded. Um, so if we look at um, what happened with the um, enrollment, initially 126 individuals were found to be eligible um, for enrollment. 68 were um, excluded because it not, did not meet all the inclusion criteria or declined for some other reason to take part. And ultimately, 58 were randomized equally into the intervention group and the comparison group. Now, the intervention group was a group of individuals who were given guidance on a diet which excluded the ALCAT positive food items. Um, and the comparison group was very carefully randomized. They were also given an exclusion diet, but uh, the exclusion diet was matched uh, such that they excluded the negative um, uh, food items. So essentially, this was a very well controlled group. There was no loss of follow up in either of these populations. And then ultimately, um, um, but there was, there was discontinuation um, on the intervention group by two people. And then there was we discontinued two individuals because we felt they were not um, meeting the criteria for following the diet. And then ultimately 26 and 29 patients were analyzed in these two populations. The demographics of the two groups were very similar. I won't go through all of them, but in terms of age, gender, BMI, et cetera, they were well controlled for. And you know, prior to randomization, when the ALCAT test was uh, conducted in all the samples, we can see the food items which gave the highest frequency of positivity. Um, so at the top, you can see strawberry, cinnamon, almond, et cetera. Um, and most importantly, uh, I'd like to point out that an, although some of these food items are as part of the high FODMAP diet, um, many of them are not. So uh, the diet that was designed um, using the ALCAT test ended up being um, different than if they had been given a generic FODMAP diet and it really was individualized based on which foods were positive for them. The primary outcome was intention to treat, um, and that was looking at a well-characterized um, uh, um, score, which is called uh, the GIS score um, in um, patients with IBS, and looking at improvement in the GI score. And then there were additional secondary outcomes, which were also um, based on uh, symptomatic scores. So this is the data, but it's best seen actually in a graphical format. Um, so here we can see at baseline, as this is particularly the GIS score at baseline, both groups had um, the same score. Um, and then there was a, this is a, actually this is a difference between at, at between baseline and week four. So of course at baseline it was the same. Um, at week four we can see that actually there was a um, an improvement, a higher score is a, a better symptom control. There was an improvement in the intervention group at four weeks, which um, persisted through to eight weeks. And this was significant um, at P of 0 0.05. And then here, similarly, in a separate score, which is seen here, um, which is a symptom-based score as well, also had improvement at four weeks. Then we actually went ahead and looked at data um, for proteomics. And um, what this data basically showed is, and this is just uh, numerical data that we didn't graph it. What this basic data basically showed is that we took uh, serum samples from patients um, and the subgroup of these patients with the highest responsiveness and look for 1,100 proteins. And this was a sort of a high throughput approach in these patients. And um, through all of these patients, if I can go through this, um, in all of these patients, um, we found that um, there were 87 um, proteins out of 1,128 which were different between the groups. But then after a the correction was made for multiple comparisons, we ended up finding that a single protein, which is neutrophil elastase, was found to be reduced in the strong respondents. And this is, um, you know, this was a completely blinded um, high throughput approach. But what's very relevant is that, you know, neutrophil elastase is a protein that's released during neutrophil activation. And it suggests that individuals who had high response um, actually ended up um, having a decrease in this inflammatory marker. 
So that's that's the overall um, uh, view of this um, clinical study. And and the reason we found it actually very exciting is that firstly, of course, um, that you know we ha this could be used to develop a diet which would appears to and has been demonstrated in this in a, in a very rigorously controlled way to help patients um, IBS symptom control. And then secondly, to actually do this in an individualized way, um, such that you know, limited foods are removed from patients' diet, which obviously makes it much more likely that they'll be able to be compliant to a diet long-term, um, which really is not possible for the food map diet for, um, you know, for patients over a long-term basis. So I think at this point, I mean, we have a second paper, which actually is an immediate follow-on from this and looks at some of the scientific um, and the mechanistic basis behind this, but this might be a good point to stop and see if anybody has any questions about the clinical trial. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, of course, having a clinical finding um, in response to a test is, is fantastic. And, and clinically, that's the most useful data set for us to, um, you know, manage our patients. But of course, it's also important trying to understand you know, how um, a particular test or, or diagnostic uh, is working. And so the second study was actually related to this. And the overall approach here was to see um, what might be the mechanistic basis for this. And, you know, a priori, it could have been multiple different things. I mean, it could be that, um, that removing a certain food item was actually improving perhaps motility in the gut by working on some gut nerves, for example, or um, it was affecting the microbiome or um, affecting you know a number of different things so what we decided to look at you know because we had that signal from elastase suggesting that actually there was an inflammatory mechanism to this what we decided to look at was to see if um, that interaction of positive foods with peripheral blood immune cells um, in patients uh, and subjects actually results in, in any evidence of an inflammatory response, which is not the case if um, subjects are, subjects' peripheral blood lymphocytes are cultured with food items that are um, you know, negative for, um, on the ALCAT test. So you know, we um, um, took 20 healthy volunteers and then initially established um, their ALCAT test positivity and then Subsequent to that, um, took peripheral blood, um, obtained lymphocytes, and then cultured the lymphocytes with positive and negative food items, and then looked at a particular inflammatory marker. And recently, there's been a lot of um, uh, information um, and evidence that release of DNA by immune cells is actually a very pro-inflammatory um, effect with the released DNA then going on and activating other immune cells through TOL receptor 9. So this was the assay that we looked at um, initially. And here is just a schema of this. So um, the circle is a, just a schema for a cell. Um, and the, the concept would be um, that uh, a positive food item would result in release of extracellular release of DNA, and that a negative food item could either certainly by itself not release any DNA and maybe even block it. Um, and if this was the case, then we had um, also an interest in trying to identify what the cell intracellular signaling pathways might be. And we looked at a number of different ones. And here, just for purposes of a diagram, we've got protein kinase C. And then release of DNA could be either nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA. And both uh, can be found extracellular, extracellularly. So this, again, is a schema of exactly what we did. So initially, we had 20 healthy subjects. And the first stage of the experiment was sending the blood in an entirely you know, blinded way um, for conventional um, ALCAT testing. So at, by this point, we had lists of positive and negative foods for these individuals. And the secondly, and the investigative part of the experiment was actually to culture the leukocytes um, with positive food items or separately with negative food items. Um, and then to analyze DNA release, myeloperoxidase, and flow cytometry to look for cell surface activation markers. And uh, the approach was really to start off with a null hypothesis, which really um, would be saying that if there was no difference um, in culturing cells with either positive or negative foods, 
then there should be no difference in the amount of DNA released or myeloprox supernatant or any sort of flow cytometric markers when this is all analyzed. So I'd like to um, go ahead and first look at the first data set. And so if we look at figure A, this is looking at the amount of DNA in the supernatant from cultured cells. Um, and there's a certain amount at baseline. So if cult cells are cultured um, and there's no additional food added, a certain amount of DNA, approximately a little less than 1.5 nanograms per ml was present in the supernatant. Um, if a positive food item was added, this was significantly higher and almost double, um, approaching three nanograms per ml, probably about 2.8 nanograms per ml. Um, and if negative food was added, then the amount of DNA release was significantly less than with positive food items. Another way of analyzing it um, you know, with the null hypothesis approach is that if the null hypothesis would predict that um, there would be as many samples where the negative food gave a higher release than the positive as there are samples where positive food gave a higher release than negative. And in fact, what we found was that in 70% of the cases of the individuals, um, the positive food items gave a, a higher DNA release than the negative food items. And if both were added, actually what we found was that um, this ended up suppressing the DNA release, suggesting that the negative food items were actually dominant in this setting. Then we wish to identify whether this was just a generic response and cells were releasing you know, all sorts of intracellular contents. And we looked at myeloproxidase, which is known to be released by neutrophils. And um, what we found was that there was no significant difference in myeloproxidase release in the terms of concentration of the supernatant. And also half the samples gave more release by negative foods and half the samples gave more release by positive foods. So exactly what one would predict um, if, uh, if the null hypothesis is true for myeloproxidase. Um, now, in terms of the cell signaling um, approach, what we did was, you know, we carried out the experiment as it originally had been, but only with positive foods um, and in the presence of particular cell signaling inhibitors. So here we see when positive foods are cultured, you see release or concentration a little over two nanograms per ml in this particular experiment. And then culturing with multiple um, uh, specific um, cell signaling inhibitors, we see that we found significance um, for two here, number two and number five. And number two is an NF-kappa beta inhibitor, and number five is a protein kinase C inhibitor. Um, so this suggests, up till now, the data suggests that positive foods, um, in fact, it demonstrates more than suggests that positive foods result in release of cellular DNA, which is known to be pro-inflammatory. Pro but this is not just a generic release of all sorts of components, um, because myeloproxidase was not different, um, and that this release um, is specifically um, due to or requires the presence of activated PKC and, and NF-kappa beta. And then finally, we wish to see um, if there were um, evidence, other markers for um, activation. Um, and we did this by looking at um, cell surface CD63, which goes up when cells are activated. And we did this by flow cytometry, which also allowed us to look at um, the cell types of immune cells in the peripheral blood. And what was found was that in eosinophils, but not neutrophils or basophils, that there was an increase in CD63, specifically when the cells were cultured with positive food items. Um, and again, this was seen here um, by, again, looking at sort of a null, null analysis approach where in eosinophils, 76% um, of the time, the, the positive food items gave a higher reading than the negative food items. Um, so this, this um, taking this together, it suggests that within all the peripheral blood lymphocyte populations, the eosinophils are the ones that are, if you like, activated by positive food items, and therefore this is the population that's likely releasing DNA um, in response to positive food items. So um, I think the significance of this finding really is that you know improvement in IBS could potentially be through many different mechanisms, and you know. Neuronal would be one, um, inflammatory would be other, and this really provides evidence in, in support of the inflammatory um, mechanism for, um, for um, improvement in IBS by removal of positive foods. So um, and this backs up the clinical study. So I think 
I'd like to sort of stop going over the papers right now and see if anybody ha has any questions. Dr. Mahal, were you at all surprised by the results of this clinical evaluation? Yeah, I mean, both, both to some degree. I mean, um, I uh, personally, you know, didn't have um, uh, any personal experience with this test in the past. Um, and, you know, I was approaching this in an entirely neutral fashion. Um, however, as is well known that, you know, even for therapies that clearly do work, um, you know, it can be difficult to demonstrate a difference in clinical trials, uh, particularly with something that can be as variable as irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so, you know, for those reasons, I think, you know, um, we were all very pleasantly surprised um, when we saw such a clear improvement in irritable bowel syndrome when, you know, a diet based on the ALCAT test was used. Dr. Mahal, was there anything about the outcomes in this evaluation that were um, particularly noteworthy or surprising? Um, not, not, this was less surprising because we already had a hint from the elastase um, data in the clinical study that, um, that there was a, you know, an immune component to this, or maybe that an immune pathway that was responsible. So, which is obviously why we designed the second study really to look specifically at immune responses. Um, so, you know, it was, it was, this was less surprising, but, you know, it was still, um, you know, important to have this, you know, as a very, um, you know, strong confirmatory test and also to, you know, nail it down to eosinophils to some degree, because obviously you know, many cells could be generating an immune response. Um, Dr. Mahal, another question. How would you reconcile the results from the clinical study where the uh, drop in neutrophil elastase was seen, obviously a neutrophil uh, product with the result in the laboratory finding that the cells most involved, at least initially, are the eosinophils. Right, no, that, that's that's a that's a good point, and I think you know um, uh, if the neutrophils in the peripheral blood had appeared um, activated, that would have been a you know direct um, comparison with the earlier study. And I think, you know, there could be, again, many, many reasons for this. We have to realize that, uh, you know, the disease and the inflammation in IBS is, is very gut-related, not surprisingly. Um, so it's one possibility is that actually neutrophil activation is taking place, but it's taking place at the site where the body is seeing these uh, food antigens, which would, of course, be the gut. Um, and um, there is data showing in IBS biopsies, not we didn't do biopsies, but other people have done biopsies in IBS tissue and, and looked at inflammatory infiltrates and found an increase in neutrophils. So, you know, neutrophils could be becoming activated and localized to the gut and any, um, you know, components they're releasing like elastase would then be picked up in the peripheral blood. So, so that's, you know, that's one possibility. Um, yeah, there'd be a cascade, and ultimately, what's happening is that you know, you know, we're we are sampling a portion of the body, which is the blood, which is not, you know, where the main disease activity, of course, is with IBS. You know, it's an intestinal disease. So that's that's one possibility, and then of course the other possibility is that, you know, the in vitro system is still, um, you know, obviously very simplified version of what happens in the body, where we just have the immune cells and the food items. You know, obviously in the body, there's so many other things that are interacting um, and, you know, those are not reproduced in the in vitro system. One a little bit related to that that someone else brought. Um, does this stimulate I, I, I thought for um, further investigation more deep, deeply into the, the mechanisms or or, or, or do we think we've found that this um, activation of PKC and nuclear factor kappa B is, um, is, is more or less the answer to a lot of the uh, adverse reactions to foods that people have or, or we don't yet know because maybe when someone presents with different symptoms or different pathways involved? Right. So I think those are both really very good questions. I mean, the first one is obviously a, a question relating to um, clinical management of IBS patients. 
And um, you know, we have to remember that um, you know these patients. First of all, this is a very prevalent condition, and secondly, you know, these patients really do very commonly suffer, but you know, somewhat in privacy, in the sense that you know they're not presenting with any visible signs of disease, like you know jaundice or anything like that. So they are suffering, um, and this disease does take its toll, but it, you know, it tends to be a very private sort of toll that patients are going through by just obviously pain and missing work and, and quality of life. So um, in that setting, and then you know, ultimately by following the guidance of this test, there are no concerns about safety because essentially one is removing a, you know, a limited food, number of food items. So you know, based on those two criteria, I see very little reason why um, you know, why not to at least try um, and see if a, a particular patient or one of our patients with IBS might have improved symptoms if their uh, diet is, um, uh, you know, uh, basically modified based on the ALCAT testing. So in that sense, I think it has great potential. Um, and I, I, I think, um, you know, clinicians themselves will have to sort of try it and, and then gauge for themselves as to how much it benefits their individual patients. Um, you know, having said that, you know, in general, for any sort of clinical trial development, whether it's a biomarker or, or, or a therapeutic, um, the usual, you know, gold standard is that after an initial study that a larger a follow-up study, you know, preferably at different sites is conducted. And obviously that's confirmatory and then also it expands, you know, the data pool. And that I think that I think is a very good idea, and that's just for anything. It's not ALCAT test specific. I think that's for any any sure. medication. So this would be compared, you know, phase two, for example, being followed by a much larger phase three study. That type of analogy. Sure. So, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, and I can see really um, no reason for trying this because it's safe, and I I think it will help. But um, I think ideally there would be a, a larger study at a different institution to um, see. Um, you know, uh, increase the data set. Um, and then as far as, you know, the pathways go, you know, that's a complicated question because first of all, IBS, as you, I think, suggesting, you know, may, it, it almost certainly is not a uniform disease. Right. Um, so, you know, some people might develop IBS after they've had a bad bout of gastroenteritis. Um, other people might develop IBS more because um, of, you know, neurological issues such as anxiety and stress. So it's not a homogeneous disease. So it's, it's really unlikely that it has you know, one or two set of pathways. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm quite sure there are additional pathways that, that are active. So that'd be very interesting to investigate. Yeah. Um, there were just a couple of more questions that, that just came in. Is it okay if we... Uh, yeah, of course, of course. Jason? Sure, from the, from the live chat, um, one of the questions is, is DNA release a universal aspect of I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is DNA release a universal aspect of what is it? of innate immune response? Of innate. Uh, no, no. I mean, the innate immune response has many different uh, ways it can be switched on. So it's it's certainly not universal, um, but it is it is often seen when there is you know tissue injury, um, and when there's inflammation in the absence of a pathogen, which is generally called sterile inflammation. So, you know, no, no single um, mechanism is universal, uh, but it is an important one and a common one. Okay, thanks for that. Were there any observed differences in the second study with regards to D, um, DNA release and, I guess, the, the severity of the individuals who died of, for example, a, a moderately okay. severe versus a severely severe? Uh. Oh right. So the study, the study, the study wasn't designed to ask that question. I mean, in a, in a, in a sense, there were because the positives gave a stronger DNA release than the negatives. So obviously, sort of by definition, there was you know a difference based on the ALCA testing, but it wasn't graded in different levels of reactivity. So high positives, low positives, middle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Yeah. And again, that that would need equivalent numbers of samples in each group so um but yeah that's a good question that could be done um that could be tested right was there was there another one jason yeah th th there are two that are sort of similar and they're both um 
clinical in nature, and I, and I think the, the heart of the question is, is there any sort of intervention, um, such as a, a nutritional or an anti-inflammatory that can prevent or, or reduce these types of reactions? Okay. Oh, so that's a very different question because, you know, everybody has some food items to which they're reactive to. So um, that's, that's not really a disease-based question. Um, and as far as I know, there's, I don't know of any manipulation that will reduce that. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that's been very rigorously tested. So the obvious one um, you know, would be if someone has not been taking that item for a number of years, does that release, you know, reduce their responsiveness to that particular item? And a different approach would be that if in addition they take a, an NSAID or take some steroids, would it reduce the reactivity? So no, we don't have any data on that, and I don't know um, if, um, if those studies have been done by anybody else. Yeah, I'll, I'll just comment. I think this is germane to the question that uh, what what many of the clinicians um, have commented to me is that um, if they retest a patient who was symptomatic and then compliant and following the test after a period of time, typically one year, that the amount or the degree of reactivity or the number of foods to which one um, reacts is usually decreased by approximately 50 percent, and of course, that would be very individual. And of course, there is what they call training of innate immune responsivity, and that is mediated by epigenetic um, um, modifications, and those do pass over time. So it would be an interesting area to look at in a more nuanced fashion. But this research, I, I'm so grateful that um, uh, your team undertook this um, because I think it's a, for us, it's a meaningful and important step to help explain to people who ask, well, look, you know, we have this clinical phenomenon, and, uh, but, but what's underlying it? And before this, we really didn't have any idea. Now I think we have a really good idea, and it makes sense from a mainstream immunological perspective, and I'm very grateful for you for doing this important work. And uh, also I'd like to thank you on behalf of everyone for taking time to explain to us your findings, and we look forward to uh, more developments and future research. So with that, thank you again, Dr. Mahal, and thanks everyone for their participation. I wish everyone a good night or day. Okay. You're welcome. Good night. Good night.